Thanks for your patience. So uh, my name is David Fetter. I'm here to talk about transition tables. Um, and I'll start with a little bit of the past because uh, it's always important. This is where you can find some of me and mine if you're ever interested. So I'd like to first talk a little bit about the past of this, uh, of this feature. It all started out very innocently when Kevin Grittner sent a message to hackers. Note the date, this is 2013. And uh, it, it started out with a kind of a theoretical idea that we were gonna use the counting algorithm to maintain materialized views. Then <laughs> years pass and Kevin Grittner, who came up with the original idea, he kind of writes several versions of this code. Uh, he gets stuck a couple times. He has this conversation on uh, hackers, uh, who's all subscribed? Okay, that's the, that's more than usual. Um, if you want to subscribe to hackers, uh, it's a high traffic list, so you subscribe with no mail, and uh, <laughs> only get CC'd on the things that really interest you by because uh, because that's how we do. Um, then. <clears throat> this is now three years later. Uh, suddenly, this is the, this is a, a, a commit, and Kevin has essentially implemented uh, transition tables for after triggers. Then, <clears throat> five months later, because <laughs> there are so many competing resources for uh, for reviewer time. Anybody that can help with that, please do. He finally got to add uh, the, the infrastructure for these ephemeral named relations, which are now a, a more generic thing in the Postgres backend. So these named relations can, uh, one of the implementations is transition tables. Um, but there can be others now, and it's not the, it, it, it's a generic good? <clears throat> so now I'd like to show a little bit about how uh, transition tables can be used. And I'd also like to showcase a few things about how um, Postgres does these things specially. Um, and this is a thing I wrote called change log trigger. Change log trigger will, well, I'll start to show you. <clears throat> First off, um, does anybody run a transaction processing system and have the question, what just happened? Anybody? No? Okay, so typical questions would be something like, uh, what was going on with client number uh, something or other during February of last year? What did the schema at that time for these tables look like? What did we set that setting to last week? And what had it been? And uh, when did we delete this record? <laughs> These are all kinds of things that are, uh, these are questions that frequently come up in transaction processing systems, but they're usually difficult to answer. Um, and the usual answer to questions like these is, I have no idea. Um, 
And the a reason that's usual for that is, I don't know how we would get this, uh, uh, this information. It's, it's already gone. The transactions are committed. Uh, once you get past that one, uh, another reason is that it would be too complicated to set all this up. There would need to be uh, triggers all over the place and there would need to be some sort of way to store each of them and then how do we make sure that we were able to query the thing f across schema changes. There's just a lot of stuff involved if you um, if you need a, a specific approach for each table that you're, who, whose activities you're recording. Um, and then there's an, yet another reason, which is more operational, uh, which is that any time you make a schema change, you maybe have to go change the way you do your logging. Um, and if you fail to do this, maybe there are consequences that you don't like. So uh, this, is, uh, th this is a common one. And it was in thinking about these kinds of issues that I came up with this, uh, the current version of the software that we have now. So what would we like? Just the setup and manual, no manual steps after the setup. We want to know who made a given change and when they did it, down to the row and column level if necessary. Uh, we want this to not suddenly break when we make schema changes. We want it easy to query. In other words, we want magic. Well, maybe it isn't magic. We have a l giant toolbox, much of wh which was invented here. <clears throat> so there are some, some of the things in the toolbox are triggers. As of Postgres 10, there are per statement triggers, and this is where the transition tables surface for everyone. Uh, who's running 10 right now? <laughs> I see one, one, one brave soul. This is good. Um, oh, two? Excellent. Oh, okay, so more, more, more people. Um, so 10 is already pretty stable, and, and you can run it in production. And if not, you can at least start testing things on it. Um, and then we have event triggers. Um, is anybody using those in production yet? No? Okay, um, I, I'll, I'll go over that in a little while. Basically, triggers on events are, um, in this case, we're going to trigger on uh, table creation. And this will become important uh, later as we, as we go along. It goes to the maintenance aspect. Uh, Jason B, <laughs> uh, did somebody here have a hand in writing Jason B? <laughs> awesome, thank you. <laughs> I couldn't have done this without you. I really appreciate it. Uh, Postgres 10 also has um, automatic partitioning. Before Postgres 10, you could partition tables, but it was difficult and it was complicated and it was uh, usually very low performance even when you got the tuple writing exactly correct. So let's talk about what a logging data structure should look like given the constraints that we have for our problem. Uh, it should include who and when and where and what. And maybe we can make some inferences from all these things about why. Why is a tough question though because it sometimes depends on the time. At the time when you're making the change, the why is I'm doing this normal operation. And when you look backwards, it's, I made a terrible mistake. <laughs> so uh, why isn't constant over time? 
So we have a who. We have a where, so we just, uh, the, the sensible thing is just to use what the database uses, the table schema and the table name. Uh, we want to record when, and for that we use a timestamp with time zone. Really, please. <laughs> Does anybody know why I should be using timestamp with time zone? Yes, okay, so timestamp with time zone is a way to um, make you thank yourself later for the work you did now because it ensures that your time is always monotonic <laughs> and uh, it doesn't depend on which time zone you, your client happens to be in. So it's, uh, um, it's very helpful when you, when you go back later and you try to reason about things. So, then there's the what. So, uh, there's an old row, assuming it's, it's applicable. You, when you do an insert, there is no old row. A new row, also if applicable. Again, if you delete, there is no uh, new row. Um, we're serializing as JSONB because that always lets you do, uh, do the same thing no matter what shape the row is. Um, and this makes it impervious to DDL, as I just mentioned. There are excellent query tools and getting even better each Postgres release. So this will improve itself over time, even if I don't manage to get it improved. Uh, and it's friendly to indexes, which will help as these things grow. So this is what it looks like. Oh, I, um, oops. I stuck in a Postgres 11 feature, which was just done by uh, Alvaro Herrera uh, a couple weeks ago, where you can index the top of a partition hierarchy and just have that just work. Uh, really appreciate all the effort that went into that. It turned out not to be quite as easy uh, as it first appears. And we indexed on timestamp because that's Frequently, where you're going, the, the thing that's in common with all of your possible queries is when did this happen? Uh, so, because you don't want everything all in one big lump, uh, we make a branch table, um, which, which is a partition that holds everything in public, and then another table for your, to, to log your foo table. Um, and now we have to figure out how to record events and log them in the correct table now that they're made. So we've, we've, made, a ta we've made a table hierarchy, we've, um, we've figured out a good shape for it, and now we need to get stuff in there. And here is where we use our transition tables with the per statement triggers. Uh, we need one on each of insert, update, and delete. So um, the, the thing that you'll notice that you might not have seen before in, um, in creating a trigger is this. It says referencing new table as new table. And this is where our transition table appears. So. This is also part of the reason why we can't have a trigger for all of the right operations. Because the next one, we have delete and it says referencing old ta table as old table. Um, and if we fail to reference the thing in the, the, the transition table to which we referred in the trigger definition, uh, the trigger doesn't actually, um, can't, can't actually be made. So we need, um, we need one for each of these operations. And of course, um, when we do the update trigger, we need both tables in order to find what was the 
old version of the uh, of of the update uh, of the updated rows, and what's the new version? Um, the insert trigger body not super complicated. Um, we just uh, we just use some uh, some standard uh, things that are available in uh, PLPGSQL, and then we add on the entire state of the new row. Uh, similarly, when we delete, we add the entire state of the old row. <clears throat> and this gets just marshaled by magic uh, tuple routing for, from, the, um, from our new partitioning uh, scheme. Now this one, <laughs> this one takes a little bit of explaining. Um, what we want to do is do something a little bit like uh, Unix paste. We want to join the two tables together without having a join key. We just want them, we just want to unroll them side by side. And so this, uh, this thing with unnest and, uh, and arrayify, that's the thing that will let us have this effect. So this is, you can think of it as a little bit like Unix paste. Um, maybe I'll try and make this less, uh, uh, this grammar a little bit less obtuse uh, for a future project. Okay, so then we're on to our next table and this was all very sort of tedious and it's easy to make mistakes when something is tedious and you're doing it over and over and over again and so when things are both tedious and error prone, what do we do? That. <laughs> we go automate because nobody likes to, to be in tedious and error prone, especially when it comes to things that you may depend on later. So this is where our event triggers come in. Um, <clears throat> so has everybody, has anybody seen an event trigger before or used one? No, okay, uh, okay, at least some people. Um, so what we're doing is we're looking for the, the tag of the command that says that we have created a table. We're watching for this event and then we're responding to it by calling this function add logger. Um, Ad logger in turn um, kind of look, looks inside this um, interesting function called PG event trigger DDL commands. Um, there should only be one of them. Um, there may be a bug where this may produce two and I'll, I'll have to fix that soon. Um, and then inside of the, uh, inside of this Trigger, bot, uh, trigger function we call a different function. Now, I separated these functions so that we could go backfill if we ever needed to. Let's imagine that you have a database where uh, you, you hadn't installed this and so you install the package and now in the future all future tables will get logged in this way but the present tables are not. So I wanted to make a capability to go back and start logging on tables that already exist. And that's where add logging items uh, comes in. Um, basically, uh, it's the add logging items takes as uh, takes as input a schema name and a table name and then it does all that tedious and error prone work for you in a way that's relatively easy to reason about. So on this thing, uh, on, on this particular project I have a to-do list so maybe we should see about propagating indexes like primary keys into the index structure of the leaf table so that we could do primary key lookups uh, even faster 
let's imagine we're not doing a time-based thing, but we're doing a key-based lookup as to the history. Um, it's usually good to separate the transaction processing things from the analytics things. So you don't want to run analytics queries in your transaction processing database if you can possibly avoid it. So one way uh, we could do this is with foreign data wrappers. This would let you just write directly to a, a remote database or there are some other options for, for how this might work. Um, yet another one that I, that I came up with recently was um, have less code and data triggering on the, um, on the publisher side of this uh, system because adding triggers to a transaction processing system means that you're executing a lot more code there and maybe you don't want to do that. Uh, so maybe we could use logical decoding to do these, um, uh, these kind of uh, uh, separation of transaction processing from analytics. And then of course there's the really important stuff that I haven't thought of yet. <laughs> um, and this, I utterly depend on your help in order to, 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 to do. Please file bug reports, feature requests, all kinds of things like that. On, uh, on, on the GitHub. So now I'm going to move into a little bit of the future of transition tables, which is kind of what was originally um, the original idea that drove the feature in the first place. Uh, what we actually want to do is be able to maintain materialized views. Um, is anybody using materialized views right now? Ah, okay. So uh, when you want to refresh the materialized view, is that, a, oh, is that a fairly manual process? Yes, no, maybe. <laughs> okay, so right now you can uh, trigger, you can refresh materialized view and then it will block or you can refresh materialized view concurrently and it will not block, but it won't be done by the time you, you're finished. And what you'd really like is for, uh, to have some flexibility as to when and how uh, materialized views are refreshed because maybe you want them stable and you don't want them to, uh, to be changed by every single row change, or maybe you want them to be you know, maybe they're a dashboard and they need to be up to date immediately, uh, no matter what. And you need to have this choice uh, of how you, of what view materialization strategy you're using. Right now, the materialization strategy that's built in is a batch strategy. And so the views stay very stable until the, until you have to go update them. Um, but they, they can't be responsive in the sense that a dashboard would be. So uh, I'd like to talk about how this would be done for simple views. And we're back to that counting algorithm of 2013. This was actually invented, I think, in the mid-1980s. Don't quote me on that. Um, and fortunately, we're finally catching up with the 1980s in, in database land. Um, so that's, uh, that, that, that's one type of view, um, and that is built to top transition tables. Uh, basically what you do with the counting algorithm is you figure out how many times a, um, a row should appear in your materialized view based on the base tables, and then you decrement that, um, that count based on the, uh, transition, ta the, 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 essentially the diff of the transition tables um, that you have in your query. So basically you, you store a, a count off to one side of your materialized view for each row. Um, and then when that count changes based on the, uh, on the 
the data manipulation thing that you have just done, you increment or decrement the counter. When the counter gets to zero, the row goes away. Um, any questions on that algorithm? Nope. Um, so, okay, so the, when you, for, for this counting algorithm, you need to, um, when, it, when you initially materialize the view, you need to include at each row the count of how many times it is, it, it, it would have been generated um, from the underlying system. So you basically you have to append uh, count star, <laughs> and, and then group by everything that's in the, uh, the, the materialized view. Um, so that's the thing that you store, and the materialized view ha now has this extra column with the count in it. When you do a data manipulation operation, you get the transition tables. You get old and new, and then from these uh, old and new operations, you can infer how, how, many, uh, uh, how many times a given row in the materialized view has been um, incremented or decremented. Right, this is for simple views and that's right. The, 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 the counting algorithm was basically a, a thing to make sure that simple views are uh, maintainable in this way. Um, we'll get to more complicated ones in a, in a little bit. Um, does that clarify what, uh, we good on that? Okay, so um, then there's recursive views which are handled in an entirely different way. Um, and this is called delete and rederive. So, rather than um, trying to figure out counts and incrementing or decrementing, which is a kind of a shortcut, uh, what we do instead is figure out what's in the, um, what, show, what could have shown up in the, um, uh, in the materialized view. So you join basically the uh, materialized, or you, yeah, you outer join the materialized view to the, um, to the transition tables, and then you figure out which things, uh, which rows um, need to be deleted and, and restuck in there, and which ones don't. Um, and this is at least possible with transition tables. It's a lot less fun, but again, if you're materializing something that has uh, recursive views in it, it's good that you have this ability. Um, and as I, as I was just explaining, this too is built atop transition tables. Um, then there's another case. Um, by the way, I'll publish these slides as, uh, as soon as I can. Um, which, uh, yeah, unfortunately that's a heavier weight operation. So, uh, for aggregates we have, well, I've, I've divided them into three types. There's the good. Uh, these are aggregates like sum and count. These are stored as is. There's nothing off to one side. There's nothing extra special that you have to do. And what's really nice is that they're simple to update with transition tables precisely because you can incrementally update them uh, as you go along. So a sum, you look at the transition tables and see how the sum changed and you change it. A count, you do the same thing. Um, and that's your happy place and that's you know, relatively straightforward to do. Um, <clears throat> then there's um, aggregates which are, uh, I guess you could call them bad. So this is average, standard deviation would be two examples. These need to be stored in a different form. So to, to be able to incrementally update average, you store sum and count, and these are incrementally updatable. 
um, and then you divide, you know, sum by count before you display it, and that's how you kind of get your your um, your aggregation. It would be nice, and I I'd like to see about a feature to do this where we could have the um, sum and count be kind of invisible columns, and then the average would be the visible one that's you know derived from them, but we don't yet have a mechanism for that other than creating a view atop the materialized view. So that would be a nice feature to, to do. Um, and then for standard deviation, there's this complicated procedure that where you use the number of uh, um, the number of samples, the sum and the sum of the squares. Um, and there's some complex arithmetic that you can look up in statistics books as to how this is done. Um, but you can, you can maintain them incrementally. And that's, you know, that, that makes this, you know, a not so bad case. Then, unfortunately, there are some really ugly aggregates. Um, so this would be uh, median, um, which you use, which you spell with percentile continuous uh, of 0 0.5, um, array ag, and unfortunately, these are stored in a different form that's really bulky. They can't really, um, they, they can't really be done, and they have to be recomputed entirely at every change. So this is the unfun kinds of things, but they may be just what you need, and so we will we'll, we'll have to be able to handle them. Um, and maybe there's something clever you can do with medians to, to reduce the amount of computation, but frequently not. Um, righty. So, questions? I don't know how much time we've got. As we were somewhere, somewhat late with the beginning of our session, um, please do not be too lengthy with your questions. Can you explain how do transition tables work on the hood? So what it is? It is a temporary file or it is just a number of links to the tuples in the heap? What is it? So there are old rows, new rows. What are they on the hood? Right. So the question was uh, how are uh, how are transition tables sort of implemented, and they, um, you can think of them as, uh, as being something like the uh, with clauses, so they're available as tables for the duration of your query, and then they go away. So they're not stored unless you decide to store them, um, and you can, of course, decide to store them, but by default, they're just a tuple stores that you can use in queries. Um, Спасибо. Thanks.